Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Matthew Jane, and I am the Learning and Engagement Manager for the State Historical Society of Iowa. The Iowa History 101 webinars, presented on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month, explore Iowa's history from pre-statehood to current day. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at history.iowa.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today, we'll hear from Jerome Thompson. Today's program will focus on uh, Duane native Robert Smith and his work during and after World War II in the Gray's Registration Branch of the U.S. Army Quartermaster Corps. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came in this webinar with on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in just a few days. I've disabled the chat function, but if you have any questions, please type them into our Q&A feature here. For the webinar, my colleague Jess Runlet is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all the questions. Now, I'm very excited to introduce our presenter for today. Jerome Thompson retired in 2015 after serving 33 years with the State Historical Society of Iowa. During his tenure, he served in various capacities, including Historic Sites Administrator, Museum Bureau Chief, and State Curator. He also served as Acting Administrator, Acting State Historic Preservation Officer, and Acting State Archivist. Prior to his employment with Shishi, he was the first site coordinator at Terrace Hill from 1978 to 1982. He is a native of Ames, and he has a BA in Anthropology from Iowa State and an MA in Museum Science from Texas Tech. Thompson is past president and board member of the Iowa Museum Association and served on the board of the Iowa Preservation and Conservation Consortium. He served on the advisory committee to the Iowa State, uh, pardon me, the committee to the Iowa Office of the State Arche Archaeologist and the advisory board of the University Museums at Iowa State. He was recognized with the Alan Hutchings Visionary Award from Sales and Smokestacks National Heritage Area, an award of merit from the American Association of State and Local History, Preservationist of the Year in 2015, by Preservation Iowa and the 2018 Leadership Award from the Iowa Museum Association. He was elected to the Board of Trustees of the State Historical Society of Iowa in 2016 and began his third term in 2022. In 2017, he was elected to the board of the Iowa Jewish Historical Society. He's a contributor to the Iowa History Journal and volunteers at the Iowa Gold Star Military Museum of Camp Dodge. He also recently curated two new exhibits for University Museums at Iowa State, located at their Christian Peterson Art Museum. One is running through spring semester and the other through December. So make sure to head back to campus to check them out. And now I'm happy to turn over to Jerome to begin the webinar. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks, Matt, for the introduction. Um, I think today you're gonna see a different kind of a military history program than you normally think about. You know, usually it's uh, soldiers in combat or things like that, but Robert Smith uh, had a different service. Um, Matt mentioned that I'm a volunteer at the Iowa Gold Star Museum, and that's where I discovered Robert T. Smith. Um, about a month after I started uh, volunteering there, my first assignment was to go through um, all of the maps and oversized documents and kind of rehouse them and reorganize them and inventory them. And in the process, I found two very interesting hand-drawn maps uh, from Bougainville Island in the Pacific. And on those maps, there were uh, graves marked. Uh, the catalog number led me to a document box that contained over 50 items that had been given to the museum in 2005 by uh, a man from uh, Waukee who was a personal friend of Robert Smith. Um, Mike Vogt, the curator of the Gold Star, um, was able to locate Smith's um, service record from uh, his post-war uh, request for World War II compensation. That was in 1949, and it still listed him as being on active duty. Um, Ed Weiland, who donated the collection, um, was by that time when I discovered it deceased. So uh, a chance to interview him uh, was not possible. But he mentioned a couple of things that he was, Smith was from Des Moines. Um, 
and he was a designer at a Des Moines department store. But the question was, there were a bunch of them in the 1930s, and which one did he uh, work for? Uh, turning to the Des Moines Register uh, archive for the Register and Tribune, I did a search for Smith, and lo and behold, I found a photograph of him um, with a butterfly collection from somewhere in the South Pacific. But one of the clues that came up in there was that said that he was the son of Nellie Dooley. And that led me to be able to start searching census records and city directories. Uh, fortunately, from the comfort of my own home, I was able to get into the Urbandale Public Library uh, uh, research engines and was able to get into Heritage Quest to be able to look for both military records as well as city directories. Uh, the Des Moines Public Library happened to have, or happens to have, all of the digitized copies of Des Moines high school yearbooks. And so there was another place to look. Google is an amazing search engine. Um, and sometimes you don't wanna use it too much as a crutch, but I just plugged in Robert T. Smith and I hit gold. There were two blog entries from the Smithsonian Archives of Anthropology that were written by a graduate intern uh, at the archives. And one of the th key things that she did was to include his service or serial number. And it was a match. That was just exciting. So it started to kind of go further down the rabbit hole uh, with um, correspondence with the archives and to find out a little bit more about the people who gave Smith's collection to them. Uh, we also shared the information from the Gold Star Museum to them so that they would have uh, a box list of what's, what's at the Gold Star. Um, the collection had not been processed. And so there were a few things that were included in the blog, such as photographs uh, of images from his collection and um, other uh, types of things. Uh, I obtained permission to download uh, and use images such as the one you see on your screen right now of Smith uh, somewhere in the South Pacific on a boat going between islands, which is where he did the bulk of his work. It was kind of tricky during the time corresponding with them because they were on the verge of a government shutdown. And I didn't know how many months it might take for my emails to even be seen, but it all seemed to work out. Um, I published Smith's story in the January issue of Iowa History Journal. And that's kind of where we're going to begin next. Airplanes fall up, not down, is the opinion of the American Graves Registration Service and recovery personnel now operating in the New Guinea area. Teams of volunteer personnel are based at Finch Island, New Guinea, where the temporary National Cemetery for the Southwest Pacific is located. This work is an attempt to investigate all isolated air crashes, infantry burials, where there is sufficient leads to warrant a search. This was in a letter to a colleague written by Robert Smith. Smith, a native of Des Moines, uh, spent World War II in the following years up to the Korean War in the Graves Registration Branch of the U.S. Army Quartermaster Corps. His duty took him from the 113th Cavalry's Red Horse Armory in Des Moines in 1941 to the South Pacific from 1943 to 1949. He spent his service searching for the remains of downed airmen and ground troops killed in action or declared missing. His discoveries while often fragmentary, could provide closure to the families of American servicemen lost in the war. His story is found at the archives at the Iowa Gold Star Military Museum at Camp Dodge in Johnston, Iowa, 
and in the Smithsonian Institution's Archives of Anthropology. Smith left three years of journals, letters, papers, and ephemera that document his time working in the jungles of New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. Since the Civil War, the care of deceased military personnel and the maintenance of the national cemeteries are among the duties assigned to the Quartermaster General. 16 Americans uh, served in World War II and more than 400,000 died, according to the Defense Department uh, POW MIA accounting agency. At the end of, the, of World War II, there were 79,000 Americans unaccounted for. This included those uh, buried as unknowns, um, lost at sea, or missing in action. Following World War II, the United States initiated the return of war, uh, World War II dead program. This program was to locate crash sites, re-examine battlefields for isolated graves, and to disinter temporary military cemeteries around the world. The U.S. Army created the American Graves Registration Service to take up this task. Smith could have gone home after the war, but he extended his service with uh, Graves Registration and stayed combing the jungles in New Guinea. Smith was born in Des Moines in 1918. He and a younger sister, Mildred, were adopted by N Nellie Dooley. Uh, Mrs. Dooley was a nurse by occupation. The 1930 census shows them living on Illinois Street along with three borders, which during the depression would not be uncommon. At the time, Mrs. Dooley was divorced. Smith graduated from North High School in 1937. Next to his senior picture uh, in the North High Oracle, he indicated his ambition was to become an interior designer. His occupation was listed as helper or assistant in the Des Moines City directories from 1939 to 1941. Joe Weiland, who donated his papers, wrote that Smith was an excellent artist and worked as a display designer in downtown Des Moines before the war. A bronze plaque from the Yonkers department store in the collections of the State Historical Society of Iowa lists Smith as an employee in service during the war. It's clear that he never returned to designing store displays. Smith and his friend Joe Weiland were both members of the Iowa National Guard 113th Cavalry uh, and were mobilized at the same time. Weiland stayed with the 113th and was deployed to Europe. Smith was reassigned to the 8th Corps and went to the Pacific. A photograph in the February 4th, 1944 edition of the Des Moines Tribune shows Smith with a collection of framed butterflies. The caption reads, when the guns stopped booming in the Solomons, Staff Sergeant Robert T. Smith of Des Moines begins butterfly chasing. His complete and valuable collection while uh, resting from frontline duty at an advanced base, Sergeant Smith is the son of Mrs. Nell Dooley. His butterfly collection is just one indication of a lifelong interest in natural history that is seen in his journals and his sketchbooks. Mrs. Dooley passed away on August 12, 1947. Her obituary stated her son Robert, stationed in New Guinea, flew by plane to attend her funeral. A year later, an entry in his journal from uh, Friday, August 13, 1948, stated, quote, a year ago, I arrived in Chicago on a large DC-6 aircraft, and now I'm about as far away from civilization as I can get with the exception of being inland for four more days. In an uh, undated document, Smith described his work. 
quote, missions have been carried with searchers as high as 9,400 feet into the mountains and even eight feet under in a mangrove swamp. Many times searchers find themselves in the areas very little traveled by white personnel, especially Americans. The majority of these missions are done on foot, and whether it be a short half-day mission or a 21-day mission of 200 miles of mountainous jungle terrain. Smith wrote in a letter in 1945, since attending a jungle intelligence school on Guadalcanal, May through July 1943, as an assistant instructor in maps, etc., I have been, quote, bush happy and always had hoped for an assignment into the bush for a lost plane or something. I also had been told once here by one of my COs that my hobbies come first and the army second. On that date, I made up my mind to prove that my hobbies would be of use to the Army. According to one of his journals from 1948, Smith and his guide, Nilbo, spent nearly a month hiking to different villages seeking information and investigating leads on a lost aircraft. He wrote, a search team usually consists of two or three men with such equipment as necessary for a particular mission. This generally includes a jungle pack with two blankets, hammock and toilet articles, a bush knife, first aid kit, an entrenching tool attached to the pack, and food for the 10 in one or new C-type rations are preferred. All packs and cargo are carried by natives. Uh, this is a portrait of his guide that uh, is in the Smithsonian collection. Sea rations were not always standard cuisine. Several times he mentions in his journals that he stocked up on canned corned beef. While on searches, meals took on a native flair too. He wrote, by the time I returned, I was half starved and sat right down to roasted taro and a green soup with three small chili pe peppers in for flavor. It was quite tasty. I had been hungry, uh, so hungry, the old song, Have You Tried Your Wheaties, kept running through my head. Lunch wasn't quite Wheaties, but it hit the spot. Food was a frequent uh, reference in his writings. Quote, large jungle pigeons go nice in the pot if there's a marksman along. Smith writes on several occasions that he used his standard M1 carbine to shoot game for food. He also wrote, additional food can be purchased from the natives if you don't mind their menus. Razor blades are generally used to purchase food as they are light to carry and in much demand. Three razor blades are equal to 16 cents, the Australian shilling. By the way, Australia had administrative authority of New Guinea before and after the Japanese occupation in World War II. Two heads of cabbage can be obtained for one blade and chickens for three to six blades. A good searcher is schooled for his work in the necessary subjects such as Pigeon English, the international island language, map reading, drawing, native psychology, jungle lore, teeth charts, and knowledge of bone structure and aircraft identification. But most important, the man must like to hike and forget about the civilized parts of the world. Bougainville is an island in the Solomon chain east of New Guinea and northeast of Australia. In late December 1943, the 182nd Infantry arrived to engage the Japanese forces that were entrenched on the island. For two months, patrols clashed with the Japanese. American forces set up an observation post on the top of Hill 260 in a 125-foot banyan tree where observers could see for miles around. In March 1944, the Japanese launched a massive counterattack 
against the American forces and took the hill. That's the banyan tree after the attack. From March 19th through March 28th, 1944, the 182nd fought to retake Hill 260 and succeeded. The cost was great, however. Company G of the 182nd had 147 men on duty at the beginning of the offensive and only 85 remained at the end. The others had been killed, wounded, or otherwise incapacitated. Smith was sent to Bougainville in July 1945 to search for the remains of missing infantrymen on Hill 260. He, along with 10 native searchers, recovered the remains of 28 soldiers. Uh, nine were unidentified and 19 were positively identified. Unidentified bodies were identified as American by uniform parts, equipment such as canteens, or in some cases, the weapons uh, found with them. Weapon serial numbers might be traced to the soldiers they were issued to and establish an identity. He maintained notes on each recovery in a message book that's pictured here. Smith wrote, this work, although morbid to some people, is good work. To find the remains of an American is a thrill, but to identify them is better. Too many of the next of kin still believe their boys to be alive somewhere in the jungles as long as they are recorded as missing in action. Remains recovered are returned to a recognized cemetery and the next of kin notified. The search work will continue until every man has given a try at possible recovery and the positive uh, or negative report recorded. Smith's efforts were an act of respect for the service of the fallen soldier and a duty to the survivors. After more recovery work, uh, by the way, these are the maps from the Gold Star Museum uh, showing the burial locations and identification of the personnel uh, by the most on the basis of their serial numbers, which would have been on their dog tags. After more recovery work during the Korean War, he was transferred to Fort Huachuca, Arizona. He continued on as a cartographer, both on active duty and later in civil service. During his years in southeastern Arizona, he became an active bird watcher. He was sought out by birders to guide them to see Mexican spotted owls. According to an article in Arizona Highways from January uh, 2003, Smith built and maintained the isolated Shelite Canyon Trail in the Huachuca Mountains. While he lived most of his life in the desert, um, Smith never lost his interest in New Guinea and made return trips uh, several times in, during his life. And I guess he remained bush happy. Smith lived out his life in Sierra Vista, Arizona, following his death in 19, uh, August 30th, 1998, a bronze marker was placed uh, in his memory on the trail he mentioned in the canyon. Quite an honor for a man who described himself as Bush Happy. Um, from the Smithsonian uh, archives, uh, there was a letter that transferred the materials to their possession that were written by two of Smith's friends. Um, they note, as an intensely private person, he revealed very little about family or his past life, except for stories he loved to tell about New Guinea or Greece, two of his favorite places to travel. 
He was a great talker and had a gift for telling many stories about his travels and his birding exploits. Smitty had a great gift for connecting with people in any place he visited and seemed to especially enjoy experiences in the national, natural world with local residents. At the time of his death, he had no known connections to any family members and wanted his personal possessions to go to friends and his landlady of many years. There was no will and no information accessible to locate any possible surviving family members. He never mentioned any living family. Um, I mentioned I mentioned that I wrote an article in Iowa History Journal, and uh, a couple of months after I wrote that article, there was an email that went to uh, Michael Swanger, who's the uh, editor, that made its way to Mike Vogt at the Gold Star Museum and then to me. Um, it was written by a researcher with the Defense Department Accounting Agency based in Honolulu, Hawaii. She wrote, I ran across this article while searching for information pertaining to T. Sergeant, Tech Sergeant, uh, Robert T. Smith, a Des Moines resident who served in the Graves Registration U.S. Quartermaster Corps during World War II in Pow Pow, New Guinea. She wrote, as the primary investigator assigned to Papua New Guinea, I conduct research and field investigations in support of recovering remains for men who are still missing from World War II. I believe that the information contained in Smith's field journals may be helpful in this work. Can you tell me what your collection consists of and if uh, any of it is digitized or how I might gain access um, for research purposes. So this researcher is actually working on Smith's cold cases 70 plus years later. Uh, this email started a string of correspondence. I sent her an inventory of Smith's holdings at the Gold Star Museum and links to information at the Smithsonian Archives in Anthropology. Uh, she was thrilled to get Smith's identif uh, identified and unidentified remains from Hill 260. Smith's first journal was partially transcribed, which I was able to send to her, but the later journals were not. They were bound surveyor's notebooks, like the one that you see on the screen. Um, and as I described, I had a contact with the preservation department at the Parks Library at Iowa State um, and explained the situation. Um, she was at that time, not only head of preservation, but acting dean of the library and um, put me in touch with one of their uh, library technicians. So I was able to withdraw the journals and took them to Ames along with the flash drive and spent a good part of an afternoon using one of their high quality uh, book scanners. Uh, with the help of the technicians, uh, we were able to increase the contrast. By the way, these were all written in pencil um, and the resulting scans were better than the originals. So we made several copies, uh, placed one in the Gold Star archives and we made copies and shipped uh, one off to Hawaii. And um, after a couple of years, I contacted the researcher to see if they were helpful. Uh, they were going to be helpful because the researcher was not able to get into the field uh, during the pandemic. Uh, it basically prevented any field work. And she hoped to get back to the field in 2023. Uh, one amazing tool in the kit today that Smith did not have is DNA. Um, in 2019, an Iowa soldier who was killed in action in Burma uh, was identified and sent home to Ames, Iowa. Um, 
There's also in 2019 a uh, man who was serving in Papua New Guinea, Private Laurel W. L. Ebert, is heading home to Iowa. Uh, he's a 20, he, a 27 year old Blairstown, Iowa native was serving with uh, Company I of the 126th Infantry Regiment and was last seen on November 26, 1942, when he and a team of eight other U.S. soldiers went on a patrol to find and silence enemy a machine gun position in Cape Killerton area of the Australian Territory of Papawa. Ebert and five others failed to return from the mission and were listed as missing in action. In January 1943, the remains of an unidentified American soldier were interred in the temporary U.S. cemetery and later was designated X-3127, and he was moved to the cemetery at Finchhaven, which is the one where Smith uh, was attached in 1945 and then moved to another internment in Manila. And um, they were unable to identify them at that time. Basically due to uh, dental records analysis and mit mitochondrial DNA analysis uh, were used to identify Elbert's remains. Uh, he was buried at Pleasantville Cemetery uh, in Blairstown, Iowa, on September 20th, uh, 19, uh, 2019, excuse me. Uh, this was an article that appeared in the Des Moines Register on um, January 30th of this year. And Major Theodore Wiltheit was shot down along the French coast but using the same process, and he was buried in a cemetery in France, um, was found and was brought home. Uh, so that work continues today and um, vastly different than Smith's work in the 1940s. And that basically kind of concludes my presentation for today. And I'd be really happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Well, thank you so much, Jerome. We have time to answer some questions. And as a reminder, if you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A feature on Zoom. Please note that we may not be able to get to all of the questions, but we will discuss as much as we can. Our first question that just came in is, given the acidic nature of the jungle, how much of the bodies do you think were found? Were they mainly skulls? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, given the fact that Many that Smith was in the field basically, uh, you know, within one or two years after um, the like the action on Bougainville, there was probably more than just fragmentary uh, remains. That that makes sense, and it's certainly depends on the timing of when those remains are found. Now another fairly specific question, Jerome. Do we know how many servicemen's remains Smith was able to find and any in that location that have been found since? Like, do we have any idea on that? Uh, not specifically. That was not one of the things that he recorded a lot. His journals, you know, basically outline uh, different expeditions that he went on and sort of the daily occurrences. Um, and a lot of the times he was using uh, native informed information. 
So he would go where the you know native people were living and ask them, you know, if they knew where there might be downed aircraft or if they knew where there were some uh, graves, but he never really quantified exactly how many he identified with the exception of uh, the Bougainville Island uh, where the, he had those particular number of people identified. Sure. Thank you. It's just such an, an interesting tale. Honestly, I have to say, I've not yet read your article, unfortunately, but this topic we've covered today, wow, makes me super interested. And you talked a little bit about the at the beginning about your research journey into this topic. And of course, as a fellow historian, this, this piqued my interest. Could you talk a little bit more about the, the beginning of the research process and what you see as valuable resources for Iowans, you know, interested in looking into anything, not just specifically this, you know, what do you like at your public library? <laughs> what I like at my public libraries, I use both the Urbandale and Des Moines public libraries, are some of their uh, databases and uh, subscriptions that I can access through my library card at home. Uh, I mentioned History Quest. Uh, that is one where you can get uh, uh, both census, city directories, um, some military records. Uh, that one is kind of handy. Uh, newspapers. Uh, I mentioned one thing uh, about using newspapers is that at the uh, state historical research centers, there is access to newspaper archive, which covers the entire United States. I personally just have uh, a subscription to the Des Moines Register archives that I use fairly often. But I did try to do a search for uh, Smith's obituary or something from Arizona, and I turned up nothing. And so I guess his, um, the two friends who donated material to the Smithsonian archives talked about how we liked to, you know, did not talk about family or other sorts of things. So maybe he didn't even have an obituary. Sure, that's... Um, but uh, again, census records were helpful to kind of fill in some of the gaps. Uh, I mentioned the Des Moines Public Libraries um, scanned uh, school yearbooks, and some of those go back to the early 1900s. I happen to be lucky to find uh, Smith's from 1937. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a super interesting and thorough answer and it it makes me think you know today as we are living in this transition from analog to digital it it truly worries me for for future researchers about what what will be left from this time because it's going to be hard to scroll through facebook in a hundred years <laughs> true um i wish the smithsonian archive of anthropology had a way of processing smith's collection and putting more of that available, that would have been really useful to me because even if I had been able to travel to uh, Maryland to uh, use the materials, uh, a government shutdown would have not permitted that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, we have had a few more questions come in from the audience, so we will jump right back into them instead of just my historical pontificating and questioning. No, is the U.S. military still look still searching for World War II sites worldwide? Uh, yes, I, I think one of the things that I've learned in this process is that um, isolated graves were not necessarily um, uh, still being found because most servicemen. Uh, you know, might be in one of the national cemeteries that would be established, for instance, in France or 
Manila or New Guinea. And that is where my understanding is, is that uh, most of the DNA research is being done at uh, the facility in Honolulu. And uh, that's where, you know, if they're, they have to have a descendant possibly of an individual to have the DNA for comparison. You know, it might be a niece or a nephew or something like that uh, would, would be the case. Um, in my own personal family, uh, I have an uncle, had an uncle that I never knew because he was killed in the Pacific by a Japanese sniper on New Georgia Island. But the one thing the family did have was the chaplain's account of his demise, which is still part of our family papers. Uh, different for my uncle Richard is that my grandfather paid to have his remains brought back and interred in the family plot in uh, Austin, Texas. Thank you. Um, so as you mentioned, you, I feel like that's a nice transition into this question, which is a little bit about legacy, because we've talked about how Smith doesn't have any descendants, which makes the DNA research hard. But do we know, was he ever recognized or decorated in any way by the armed forces for his le efforts to locate and identify U.S. servicemen? Not that I'm aware of. That's... That was my suspicion, and I'm glad you're here telling his story today. Then we have one more audience question that's in thus far. Do we know how helpful the natives were to him? I know you mentioned a little bit um, about that, but were they helpful or did they pose danger to him? No, there was no danger. Uh, truly, uh, there was a time in the New Guinea area where people were headhunters, but that was not much the case uh, in Smith's, although he did in one of his journals recount when he was visiting with a group, um, they admitted to killing a number of Japanese soldiers, mm -hmm. um, but they didn't describe exactly what they did with them. Uh, Smith did find those remains, but um, given he had a different mission to propose, uh, he never spoke with anything about any danger. Uh, they were very helpful from the standpoint of, uh, he used what he called pidgin English, which was, um, there. there's actually at the Gold Star a uh, dictionary, which would be kind of like a combination of native language and um, English that they, uh, they communicated. Uh, he had one particular guide, Milibo, that is pictured in my PowerPoint that he did a portrait of that I believe he made contact with uh, throughout his whole time there. That certainly had to be helpful to have one guide throughout his entire time there. And back on, we have just a few questions left, but back on the topic of people today, not at the time when they became deceased, do you have any suggestions for if someone wants to find World War II casualty information about best places to look, especially if they're looking for a specific person? Um, if they are from Iowa, uh, military records at the, through the Gold Star Museum would be one way of going. Um, that is not an online source, but again, there are also some of the uh, things such as through Heritage Quest, where you could find some military records. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, one, and then... one, one other thing of note is that um, in the 1970s, uh, one of the major archives for military records was at um, 
St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And that archive burned. Oh, painful, um, painful to hear about. Again, again, from personal experience, uh, my older brother, uh, who served 14 years in the army, was trying to, about the time he was able to apply for a pension, uh, wanted to document his uh, high school ROTC service. And that information would have been in the archives in St. Louis and it was not recoverable. And he missed his pension. Oh, that's awful to think how many people probably lost out because of that. That's just heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, I know that the National Archives has been trying to figure out how they might be able to piece together fragmentary records, but it's a monumental task. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Now I think we'll do one to two more questions and then wrap it up. So I have one more question. And if one more comes in on the Q&A, I will ask that. So uh, speak now or forever hold your peace on this topic, Iowa History 101 attendees. Jerome, you've done a lot of work on this. And I think the question that I like to ask to students competing in National History Day, other historians, and the question I like to ask to interesting people who are interested in interesting things is, what is the gap in the research? What's the tiny bit of information that you wish you could find? What's what's still out there on this story that you wish you could track down? Well, I, I um, of course, one of the things I cannot have access to uh, are adoption records. Uh, mm -hmm. and his sister were both adopted and those are closed records. And I, uh, I understand and appreciate that. Uh, one of the things that I tried to search for, as I mentioned before, was an obituary for Smith and was not able to find one. The other thing was to track down his younger sister. Um, in his mother's obituary from 1947, it mentions her and that she is married and living in Los Angeles. And so trying to even do like well, now that the 1950 census is uh, open uh, to try to locate her and that ended up not going anywhere. Oh, there, definitely, it sounds like there's still some leads that could be tracked down, but maybe never. Yeah, but at least ways we know more about Sergeant Smith and the work that he did and some of his background, um, more so than I knew when I opened that box at the Gold Star Museum. And being an anthropology student, his work really piqued my interest. And I said, I need to know more about this guy. Mm -hmm. a, a lot more. And I'm glad you've been able to share it today. And this will be our final question, but I kind of feel like you already, already answered it. And it's, what is the main thing you took away from working on this project? You know more about Smith, but is, is there any other main things? I, I think in taking this on, it was my own personal interest, but um, because it is not your usual military history story, I was uh, pleased that Michael Swanger with Iowa History Journal decided to include that in, you know, that publication, uh, which doesn't have the largest circulation, but it's still out there. And um, I think I think there's, in some ways. Um, not always the big stories are important, but mm -hmm. the smaller personal stories are add color to what we know. Yeah, this is an incredible personal story, and I'm so glad you shared it today. In all the years I've spent as a history enthusiast, I've never thought about something like this. So thank you. 
Oh, you're welcome. And thank you all for participating uh, in the, in the and, Iowa History 101 today. And with that, we will bring this episode of the Iowa History 101 series to a close. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. And we would like to extend one last thank you to our presenter, my history hero, Jerome Thompson. We hope everyone yeah. will sign up for future Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories to tell in the upcoming months. For more information and to register for future webinars in this series or to watch recordings, check out our website at history.iowa.gov. Looking to learn more Iowa history? You can find and watch over 50 recorded webinars of past 101 programs on the Iowa Culture YouTube channel. We look forward to virtually seeing you for the next Iowa History 101 webinar on March 21st. The topic will be Iowan Sarah Rosu on music, travel, and the herbs. Thank you again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. <laughs>